Hi everyone, this is Angeline from App Fitness, and we're here today with Arthur and Ian, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, this is Arthur Hennick. I am the father of a young man who is 33 on the autism spectrum. Okay, hi, I'm uh, Ian Hennick, and I'm the person who's actually on the autism spectrum. <laughs> hey, it's nice to meet you guys. So, Ian, when were you first diagnosed with being on the spectrum? Uh, when I was about uh, three years old. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And as you were going to school, did you feel that you were different than everyone? Did anyone treat you differently? Did you notice different things that stood out to you? Well, when I was going to school, um, even though I actually was kind of different, I didn't really feel too different from, like, my classmates and my peers. Yeah. Well, that's really good. Um, and not a lot of autists get to experience that. Like, they'll, their classmates and things show, treat them differently. So it's nice that you had a more of a positive experience. Yeah, in school, I generally had more of a positive experience. Um, I wasn't really treated that differently or too differently. I generally um, was able to, like, fit in and get along with my, like, classmates and peers and my friends and stuff in school. So, uh, yeah. Uh, in school, Ian was included uh, in an inclusive model as much as possible, with the exception of a, a couple of activities when he was pulled out of the classroom. Okay. What was it? Group activities or sports or? There were. It was more like uh, speech therapy okay. and occupational therapy and physical therapy. Yeah, because of my um, autism or my disability, I would um uh, from since I was in school, I had or got like uh, speech therapy and occupational therapy and some physical therapy too. So I had so, 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 those um excuse me kinds of things when I was in school actually though too. So yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And um, Arthur, is there anyone else in your family that's autistic? Like anyone, your your parents, siblings, anything like that? You don't have to say their names, but. Uh, no, not that we know of. Uh, it's uh, interesting because when uh, Ian was uh, diagnosed, uh, when he was uh, almost three years old, the, uh, the doctor you know, told us that uh, autism was genetic and that uh you know gene based and uh but we we couldn't really think of anybody who certainly had the diagnosis in either side of the family well you know sometimes that people are high fun or higher on the spectrum and they don't actually exhibit a lot of signs so they thought i was the first person on the spectrum in my family but my dad is exactly like me but if if you were to meet my father you would immediately say yeah he's definitely on the spectrum but i'm sure you know like back in the day they didn't really like to to diagnose people a lot and people were afraid of diagnoses just like they didn't have adhd in the dsm until the year i graduated high school so <laughs> i was out of luck when i needed those accommodations back then but so uh so, Arthur, when you first learned of your son's diagnosis when he was three, did, how did that affect you? What what were, were the things going through your mind? Well, first of all, Ian's mom and I were surprised at the okay. diagnosis. We thought, uh, well, gee, uh, you know, our son Ian seems neuronormal. But uh, he was attending a uh, daycare center, and an observant director of the center told us, you know, gee, Ian is playing differently than the other kids at the center. He's not playing with them so much. He's playing alone. So she brought in a uh, disability expert to observe, to observe the center kids and Ian and the experts said, you know, you should have Ian go to a specialist and have him uh, reviewed, which is what we did. We went to a doctor in, in uh, Hartford. We were living in Connecticut at the time. Uh, and um, 
so we were surprised that uh, at what the daycare center director said, but then we quickly accepted the diagnosis and strategized, worked hard at figuring, okay, how can we best uh, accommodate Ian and support him? And the, the doctor who made the diagnosis was very supportive and had a lot of insights into, into, into Ian's uh, behavior and growth. So for instance, the doctor said, if Ian can learn how to ride a bike, then he has a high probability of learning how to drive a car. So we thought, great. So as soon as he was old enough, we taught him how to ride a bike. And he quickly picked up on that. And sure enough, uh, about how old were you when we started giving you driving lessons? Um, when I started learning how to drive, I was uh, 16 and almost 17 when I started learning how to drive shortly after I got over his permit to drive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We gave him a lot of practice because we were nervous at first. Uh, and uh, we spent hours driving around an empty church parking lot, not on a Sunday, and uh, until he really got accustomed of being behind the wheel. And uh, so what, what? And then eventually, after I drove around like church and other parking lots like that to practice driving, I eventually got uh, he got to drive like on the roads or always actually driving on roads to practice some of that though too, which eventually happened as part of my learning how to drive. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Really excited about learning to drive. Yeah, I was excited about it. I was, uh, I, mean, I have been looking forward to it. And I was glad and happy to learn how to drive. It was uh, excited for me to have that experience, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. He, um, he spent a lot of time practicing. And how old were you when you finally got a license? Okay, so even though I started learning how to drive when I was 16 or 17, shortly after I got my orders per to drive, I actually did not get my driver's license, though, until I was uh, 21. So that's the old actually was when I finally got my driver's license to drive. Uh, yeah. Now, do you, do you drive your dad around now, too? Uh, I can do that now. Yeah, I do drive my dad around sometimes when he needs me to. Um, oh, you, I, I'm like, sometimes when I when I go out driving, I ride in the car while my dad drives, but sometimes I drive my dad places, though, too, so that works out well, so I can do that sometimes as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah one, one of the perks for me as a parent is making the kid drive. So, I'm like, no, I'm just giving you practice because, you know, I don't really like to drive, but I just say, no, I'm letting you have more practice. You need more experience behind the wheel. Uh, so... Arthur, before you found out your son was autistic, what did you know about autism? Um, very little. Uh, I'm trying to, we, my wife and I saw the movie Rain Man, but can't think what year it came out. Uh, and I think we realized, okay, you know, the Dustin Hoffman character is, you know, very different and mm -hmm. you know, clearly has a disability. Um, maybe we knew the word for it. Maybe we didn't. Um, but I think we were smart enough to know that it wasn't representative of the disability. Um, and, uh, and really... Other than that, we uh, did not know too much. I mean, we knew Ian was smart and uh, he had some gifts, but uh, we ended up jumping into uh, a lot of research on the topic. We read up on it after Ian's diagnosis and, you know, plugged into some uh, spectrum groups and went to a conference or two or three in Connecticut to learn more. Uh, and we even went to a conference where Temple Grandin spoke. Um, and it was all, you know, quite encouraging. Okay. The, the point of my asking that question is because a, a lot of people don't know about autism and their only references are what the media portrayals are. So, you know, even the younger generation, they just look at what they see in the movies like there was this movie called The Night Clerk on Netflix. And 
John Leguizamo said, he played a cop and he said to one of the victim's husband, you know, those people on the spectrum, they're all violent. And that, that was another reason why this podcast is so important to me is because of movies like that, they skew the perception of autists. And they, and they all, they lump us all together and they say things like that when it's not true. They don't go into, oh, okay, well, maybe the person is having a reaction to being overstimulated. They, they try to justify by saying, oh, they're just violent. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, for instance, most people don't know that there's an autism spectrum. Yeah. You know, that it could be, uh, a person could fall on the spectrum in a wide range of abilities and disabilities. Uh, and they, they think it's a narrow range and that more or less one size fits all. Um, so when you say the word spectrum, that's like almost foreign to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, when, when you first learned about Ian's autism and you shared that with other people like friends, family, coworkers, how did they respond? Uh, I think after some initial surprise on the diagnosis, uh, they were very supportive, the family especially, and uh, friends. Uh, Ian um, had friends throughout school. Uh, and, uh, you know, when there were birthday parties at a certain age, he was invited to birthday parties, weren't you? Yeah, that's true. I was. Like, I had the, like, I would have my own birthday parties when I was a kid that my friends to that friends would come to. But I would also get invited to, like, other friends' uh, birthday parties and stuff from the time I was a kid. From the time I was in school, I would go to and stuff. And I would sometimes do, like, social things from the time I was, I was in school to hang out with, like, uh, friends and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, while growing up, Ian wasn't the most socially engaged. He he was, you know, high functioning and still is. And um, so, I mean, he was able to talk and participate in uh, group activities. So that helped make him feel included. Yeah, that's it. So I know you said that you had some speech therapy when you were younger. Did the person that diagnosed you ever mention anything that you might be nonverbal? Uh, no, that would be nonverbal. I think did you ever mention that? I don't think so, right? Yeah, or you didn't say that probably. Uh, no. Yeah. No, you didn't. Okay. Uh, Ian. Well, no, Ian. I'm sorry. The, the reason I'm asking that is because um, sometimes the, the the person who diagnoses will say, okay, I think your child's going to be nonverbal. And then they start speech therapy to see if the child will be nonverbal. That, that's why I asked that question. But go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Not at all. Um, Ian's Ian speech, uh, when he was diagnosed, was developing you know, a little bit on the slow side. Okay. So he immediately... Uh, we enrolled him in a, a pre-kindergarten uh, integrated class where there were like three students with disabilities and three students who were neuronormal. And um, the teacher who was excellent actually used American Sign Language to help the less verbal kids learn to speak. And that helped Ian a great deal okay. when, he, when he was about three. When I started, I was only about three. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So, Ian, do you stem? You know what stemming is? STEM, um, S T like science, technology, engineering, S mathematics. No, I don't do STEM. Oh, oh, st oh, oh, you said you didn't say STEM. You said stimulation. Okay, yes. it's, 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 it's like stimulation. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah. So sometimes I feel, I like have stimulation or feel uh, stimulated. That has happened to you before, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, um, okay. So sometimes when I stim, I'm rocking back and forth like this, and I don't realize I'm doing it, but it's my reaction to anxiety or 
you know, too many sensory experiences simultaneously, or sometimes my leg shakes, or sometimes I fidget, or I have a ring, and I'll just sit there and play with it. Do you ever had when you experience overstimulation? You notice that you're doing certain things, kind of like that. Um, yeah, kind of like that. Like when I experience uh, stimulation, overstimulation, uh, sometimes I'll do stuff like uh, shaking or flapping my hands. And sometimes I'll do things or stuff like uh, shaking or rocking my head, um, things or stuff like that. So I'll do that sometimes. Yeah, or I'll do those things sometimes. Yeah. 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 What do you still uh, make noises? Uh, occasionally I'll make um, like a noise or noises. I used to do that more when I was younger, but I don't do that so much or as much anymore now. Though. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And and when you do that and people are around you, do they say anything to you or they look at you differently? Well, sometimes if I do that when like in front of other people and our people are around, I don't do it so much like I often do it by myself or alone, but occasionally sometimes I'll do it. I'm like in front of our people and our people know that sometimes they say something about it or they have said something about it, but sometimes they just ignore it or don't though. So that's the thing with that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because okay. sometimes like if I'm at a grocery store or something and my roommate's with me and he notices that I'm just getting, you know, not hyper, but I'm just, it's just too much because I can hear everything. I can hear people breathing. I can hear tapping. I can hear every single thing. And then and just, you know, the lights and every smells, all my senses are extremely heightened. So I don't like going out in public too much because then I just get all of that sense at one time. And then sometimes I do that reaction where, and I don't realize I'm rocking. And the reason I ask you that is because people look at me like I'm crazy and they'll ask my roommate, what's wrong with her? Is she weird? Does she need an ambulance or something like that? So I'm glad that you've, you've had a positive experience and that you're surrounded with people that accept you and are positive about that. That, that was my point of asking that question. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, when I don't like, sometimes people will say, oh, so you're autistic. What's your superpower? I don't really like the word superpower, but so for example, I have an eidetic memory and sometimes I do scripting. So what, what dimension do you think that you excel at? Do you think that is also because of the autism? Well, I will say that um, with me being on the autism spectrum, I do have um, like a uh, very good uh, memory for remembering things, like a photographic or photographic memory, especially like my long term memory is like really good or very good. So I do have like a good memory or like good memory skills. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's really good. Does that scare people sometimes that you can remember stuff and then they're like, wait, how do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, occasionally I would say, occasionally sometimes that has happened where when I talk about something that I, that, that I remember or can't remember, that was like a long time ago, like long term memory wise, especially if um, um, occasionally people will say, like, how can or do I remember that last year or how I remember all this or all that, that kind of thing. I have heard of gotten that before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you involved with sports or anything like that? Um, well, I'm not really uh, very athletic. Like, I don't really do or play um, any uh, ball sports, but I like to do, like, some outdoor recreational sports. Like, I like to swim. I like to walk and uh, bike ride. I like to um, occasionally uh, play uh, golf, things like that. I would say my favorite ball sport, do I have a favorite one, would be golf. I don't play really any ball sports, though. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. Do you have yeah. any other, do you have any hobbies too? Um, any hobbies? I mean, like, well, I like to um, do things in my free time, basically stuff, things like, you know, uh, watching uh, shows and sports on TV. I like to uh, go on the computer or internet to use uh, Facebook, email, and social media, and sometimes look up things on the internet. Um, and I like to be on the internet, and I like to, um, like, uh, listen to music and read sometimes. I listen to music and read books sometimes, too. Souls are basically like my hobbies that I have, things I do for part of my free time. Uh, yeah. What are your favorite books? 
books. Well, I like um, Wolfer books. Um, I actually have a bigger, pretty big collection of uh, travel books. So sometimes I'll read travel books, and sometimes I'll read. Um, and besides, but besides travel books, I'll also sometimes read um, like uh, like biographies and all biographies of people. Um, into um, like uh, political biographies, like biographies of all biographies of politicians or people like that. So I've uh, done some uh, reading of like uh, those kinds of books too, actually. Yeah. 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 It seems like you, you're continually, you enjoy learning a lot. Is that? Yeah. Fun? I, uh, I do enjoy learning a lot. I'm the type of kind of guy where I always enjoy uh, learning new things. So I do like learning a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you go to college? Um, I actually did. Yeah, that's another thing we could talk about. Um, because um, uh, so what happened was, is after I graduated from high school for college, I actually lived away from home for a couple of years and went to college um, at uh, Johnson and Wales University in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, where I studied travel and tours of the management for my college major. But ultimately, that didn't work out. So then I later transferred to be closer to home uh, to a community college where I actually finished college and graduated, or I graduated a few years ago with an associate of science degree or associate degree in, uh, in hospitality management that I got from there um, that I uh, have now. So I got a degree of that from there. So I'll stop with that. Uh, yeah. Well, that's really good. Congratulations. I think they said that, yeah. is that only one in five people on the spectrum that go to college actually succeed in college. So that's... Yeah, so Right. So for me, it took a while, but I ultimately succeeded in, in game. I didn't graduate from college. I started out well. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So congratulations for that, because I think a lot of people don't understand how difficult college is for us. Like the first time I went to college was in 92, and then I, I just couldn't handle the overstimulation. And then I dropped out when I went back in 2003. And so it was a long time between 92 and 2016 I've been in and out of college so it's you know it's nothing to be ashamed of but when you actually finish it you know it's something to be very very proud of especially being on the spectrum because of the additional things that we have to do in kindergarten in school right so, I can understand though yeah okay uh, yep did you take a lot of your classes online or did you take them in person? Um, my classes, um, I uh, took um, like in a classroom in person. I didn't take any of them online or on the internet, so that's what I did. Uh, yeah. Okay. I took them in classrooms in person, but online or on the internet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you like to travel a lot? Have you been to travel? Uh, um, yes, I do like to travel. I've been to some. I've been to some places because I like to travel. Like I've uh, been, like the traveling I've done. I've mostly uh, traveled in the United States, um, but I've been out of the country a few times. Uh, like just to Canada briefly once, and also to the Caribbean and, and Mexico um, a few times. So I've done some traveling out of the country too. I've never been to like uh, Europe or anywhere like that. But I like to go to Europe someday though. But that's travel I've done so far anyway. Uh, yeah. Did you travel with your parents? Uh, yeah, most of the um, traveling I've done has been pretty much all um, like with my parents or with my family. So, um, but, but boy, yeah, I've taken some trips or vacations before where I've traveled with them. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Where, where's your favorite place that you've visited? Um, well, I mean, I would say, uh, in the, uh, Caribbean, my favorite place I've been is the Caribbean island of Barbados, because I've been to the Caribbean. That's one of my favorite places that I've traveled to, all places I've traveled to, I would say, yeah, uh, yeah. Was it the beach or the weather? <laughs> um, well, I liked the weather, and I liked the beaches, and the sports, and, and the racial sports you could do there, water sports, beaches, weather. That was all fun when we were there, actually, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, Arthur, what kinds of things do you guys do together as a family? Um, well, uh, Ian, Ian touched upon traveling. We all like to travel together. Uh, we now live in Florida, and when we moved from Connecticut to Florida, we took a very slow car trip south, and we stopped many times along the way, you know, visiting family, 
and then visiting cities that we always wanted to go to, like Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. Um, so that was fun. So, yes, we do like to travel. Yeah, that was fun. Um, Ian and I like to play golf, even if we just hit some balls at a driving range and practice. Uh-huh. Because it's, it's such a difficult game to master. So, you know, you're always working on your swing. And um, uh, Ian really loves the game. So uh, uh, we, we, we do that together. Um, every, we uh, play little, little trivia games. Uh, you know, we, we all like to watch the TV game show Jeopardy. Which and, is a good trivia game show, yeah, TV, yeah. And uh, so we'll jump in together and uh, answer the questions if we know the answers. And we'll often uh, do the last question, the final Jeopardy question together to see if anybody gets it. Uh, and then, and then uh, sometimes I'll ask uh, Ian, you know, when the TV is off, some trivia questions on my own about Connecticut or Providence, where he went to college for a while, and he, he rarely misses the answers to those questions. Yes, we like, you know, like trivia, like asking church trivia questions and, <laughs> and giving the answers so we know them or we know those stuff. So that's the stuff that I like to do sometimes. But the fun is we're into like, you know, trivia and game shows and that kind of stuff. So yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and um, he, uh, you know, he, he does like to read. He has does he, he mentioned Ian mentioned that he has a lot of travel books. Uh, we're longtime members of the uh, AAA, the American Automobile Association, and you can get tour books from them. You know when you travel. I have a few of those. Yeah. yeah. And when we're done with them, we just give them to Ian. He he reads them constantly. He also inherited some from his late grandfather. So he has quite a collection of AAA tour books. Well, actually, I used to have quite a collection of AAA tour books, but now those are mostly gone since we moved. I just have a few of them that I saved. So the travel books I have now are more like other kinds of travel books, like uh, Folders and Fromers travel books, and um, and like uh, travel books like uh, Fromers and Fromers, but Fromers, but um, and other kinds of travel books, uh, like uh, that or like those and stuff. But I just have a few AAA tour books now. But I do have a bunch of the collection of travel books still that I. I uh, have so that's the yeah, feel fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And reading tour and travel books when he was growing up really mm-hmm. helped him learn to read, which I think is a uh, good tip for our friends on the spectrum. If you find an area of interest, you know, and you're able to read, then find books in that area, like go to the library and, um, uh, because reading travel books when he was younger really uh, solidified Ian's reading skills. That's right. And now I'm actually uh, good at reading uh, things, including reading books and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you collect postcards? Um, I have done so that actually I still have um, a, like a couple or a few of those when people uh, send me postcards from trips or vacations that they take. I often like to, you know, save them for a while. I hold on to them so I can look at them and read them every once in a while every now and then. So I do do so that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about baseball cards? Oh, I can mention that too. So I do so, so, so I do or have collected postcards. And another one of my hobbies that I haven't mentioned yet is because or since I like to watch sports on TV, as I said I mentioned earlier. Um, I also like to collect uh, baseball and other sports cards. I have a lot of baseball cards in particular, and I have like a few or a little uh, football and basketball cards too, but I have mostly baseball cards that I like to collect as for sports cards, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's your favorite baseball team? They're a baseball team. So in baseball, I'm actually a uh, New York uh, Mets fan. So that's my favorite baseball team. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, Arthur's, what would you like to tell parents that are learning about the spectrum for the first time that might be scared because they found out that, that one of their children is on the spectrum? Well, I think the number one thing is to realize you're not alone that there are you know resources out there 
other parents, support groups. Uh, if there's a school that you like, and that could be difficult sometimes, I realize, with uh, good staff, um, I mean, lean on them. And then learn as much as you can uh, about the autism spectrum and be very supportive of your child uh, because, uh, you know, it's a gift to have a child on the spectrum and um, you want to make the most of it and uh, get the best possible outcomes, whether it's in school or at home. Um, you know, I belong here in Florida to several autism groups on Facebook and I see a lot, I see a lot of postings from parents who sound like pretty desperate uh, because, you know, their child, for instance, has constant meltdowns or isn't learning to eat or isn't potty trained. And you just want to tell them, you know, hang in there. It's going to get better. Uh, you know, learn as much as you can. Be supportive. Uh, and uh, uh, things, will, things will surprise you at how they turn out. Yeah. Um, what part of Florida are you in? We're in the Tampa Bay area on the Gulf Coast. Okay. We actually in Clearwater in the Tampa area on the Gulf Coast. Yeah, that's where we are in Florida. <laughs> yep. Yeah, App Fitness is based in Orlando, and we were going to have fundraisers this year to said that we can open up a nonprofit fitness studio specifically for autistic people. But obviously, you know, COVID hit. So eventually, when we get our studio open, you're more than welcome to come visit us. And, you know, if we have a, a group meeting or something like that, you're more than welcome to speak at it. That's Thank gonna, you. Down in the future, you know, after, because we don't know how long COVID is going to be. <laughs> Sure. But thank you for that. I thought we could somewhere in the future down the road to do that. Yeah. We'd, we'd be happy to. Uh, can I ask you, you said a fitness studio, like a workout studio? Yeah, I'm actually. Uh, so the backstory behind that is that they didn't notice the characteristic of my being on the spectrum or my having ADHD when I was little because my father was in the military. And ever since I was little he always made me play sports so even as a baby before I was able to walk he would hold me and like try to make me kick a, a soccer ball because that was his favorite sport and then I started walking at nine months and speaking and he had me on the he wanted a son so I was basically like a son so I was on the boys soccer team and I did gymnastics capoeira racquetball uh ping pong I've flag football. I've done so many different sports, but it wasn't until I got older and I started my activity decreased that the symptoms became evident. And I found myself exercising in gyms for up to seven hours a day. And then the doctors told me, well, that's because exercise occupies the same motor functions as ADHD and autism. And I was going through a rough period of time. I don't know, um, Ian, have you been employed? Yes, I've been employed. I mean, I don't work um, right now or currently because I was let go from my last joyous job uh, due to uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 concerns. But I have worked before several different jobs in the past um, because or since in college, I studied hospitality management since I graduated from college five years ago in 2015. I've had um, a few different jobs working specifically in a hospitality and customer service. Service, including a couple that I did in Connecticut and a couple that I've done in Florida since we moved out here three, um, three years ago. Um, in Connecticut, I uh, worked in a uh, hotel kitchen as a dishwasher and also in a uh, retirement facility kitchen as a uh, kitchen utility worker. And since I've been in Florida, um, just since we moved out here like three years ago, I've worked. Uh, first, I worked for a summer season um, at a 
uh, minor league uh, spring training baseball ballpark as a uh, concession stand runner. So I did that um, for like about uh, six months during spring training baseball season a couple of years ago or two years ago for a year or season once. And since and since I left that job, I've worked at our job for um, like a little over a year from almost two years ago until like about um, seven months ago uh, when I uh, left the job. Uh, well, sorry, what's going on off the job? I was working as like a uh, kitchen steward, working in the kitchen of a big um, golf resort. So I had that job for a while doing that since I've been in Florida. So those are a couple of jobs I've had where I worked uh, since I've been living down here in Clearwater, Florida. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I'm asking that because I know uh, a lot of people, even on Facebook, that have told me this. And then also I've experienced it myself. There's a lot of workplace discrimination, especially I'm in the legal field. And when people find out I'm autistic, then they tend to treat me differently. I've actually been at a firm where the HR person researched lobotomies and tried to get me to schedule one. And she says, if you don't you know, schedule the surgery and you continue to be autistic, then you can't keep your job. So. Did you say lobotomy? Yeah. <laughs> That's disgusting. It, it is. Uh, and I, I tell people that even though I'm in the legal field, the law firms are probably the most illegal places to work because they can always find loopholes and, and things like that to get around the thing to justify what they tell people and how they treat people. So it was during that time that I was struggling with, you know, being discriminated against for characteristics of the autism I've been told. You need to let your coworkers hug you. Otherwise, you can't keep your job. You need to learn how to smile and laugh at people's jokes. And my response is, they're not funny. I'm not, I, I can't, you know, smiling and laughing is not natural to me. It's not something I do. You know, anyway, so that's when I, I found myself exercising about seven hours a day. And that's when the doctors were telling me that it was because it was allaying the symptoms and the stimming that are associated with ADHD and autism. So I figured since I spent that much time in the gym, I might as well get certified as a personal trainer. And I'm certified as a personal trainer, a bar instructor, and a yoga teacher. And I found it out that this is a nonprofit organization to help other people that might be in a similar situation that can lead to depression, you know, because with that sort of workplace determination for not being surrounded with by supportive people can greatly impact your life negatively so that you might have depression, you might feel suicidal. And my finding at fitness, I wanted it to be on profit so that we could reach the people that don't have the money or the resources to be able to access the typical services that other people can have. You know, like this mental health Therapy sessions are about 100 to 150 an hour, and some of them will take insurance. And you've got parents struggling out there, you know, trying to keep up with the doctor's visits and the insurance, and you know, they have to pay for the car, the rent, everything else. They can't afford these extra sessions and things like that. So, at fitness, the studio is going to be more than just solely a gym fitness facility. It's also going to have different modalities available to it like we have people on our networks that do emdr which is trauma therapy it also helps with ADHD. we have mental health procedures. we have energy healers. we have a bunch of different people that i've kind of screened and selected so that if other parents come and they say i need a referral i give them a couple of names that way they don't have to go and research and start to track and not know who who's going to be good and who's not going to be good. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's good then. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, so when I say fitness studio, it's mostly going to be fitness, but we're also going to have different modalities. Like one of my, the ways I, I stem sometimes is through art. So I'll paint. I like listening to music. So we're going to have art therapy, music therapy, um, Probably some form of pet therapy, but not cats because I'm allergic to cats. So, other types of animals. 
So it's not just going to be only fitness. It's going to be so many different things so that autists can kind of figure out which modality works best for them to help them. Just like Arthur, when you, you realize that he didn't love travel, so you gave him travel books and that's what helped him learn to read. So it's gonna be something like that. Yes. Yeah, um, you really, you, you have to find what you love, like you did, and pursue it. And I think that it's so beneficial. So, Ian, would you like to say anything to anyone out there, any autistic? So pretend you're speaking to someone who's autistic and is not comfortable with being autistic. Because I've actually, I've had people tell me, I don't want to be autistic. I want to be cured. I've had, uh, there, there was a gentleman that I met one time and he said that he had been married for 20 years. And he would sneak out to support groups because he didn't want to tell his wife or his family he was autistic. So do you have anything being autistic and you, you seem very comfortable being autistic, just be not very comfortable being autistic. I'm not ashamed of it. I embrace it. You know, it's, it's part of me. It's, it's part of what I am, part of who I am, my personality. It makes me excel at the things that I do. So being new and being comfortable on the spectrum, Ian, what would you say to people that are ashamed of being on the spectrum or scared? Okay, so for people who are scared about being autistic and don't want to like get into their talk about it or whatever, I would just say that I think it's good actually um, to be open about it and to um, talk about it or discuss it with people, just be open about it. Because I think uh, being autistic and our people knowing about it um, can actually be like a uh, good thing rather than a bad thing um, because it's uh, b b b because I just think it's good uh, you, you, um, for people to know if you have that disability or disorder. It's a, it's good for people to know um, that you're actually autistic or you're also special. That's I think of that anyway, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And Arthur, what would you say to the people that might be apprehensive about that as well, other than, you know, just hang in there? Anything else you'd like to add to what you said before? Sure. I mean, in Ian's case, uh, we found that his brain and his abilities grew way beyond what the experts said it would stop growing, let's say 20, 21. I mean, he learned new things into his 20s. It was like he was adding brain cells, you know, throughout his 20s. And in fact, it hasn't stopped yet. And he, uh, he's his abilities are still growing so you know it is possible to uh, you know grow and change you know you know way beyond when you think there should be a stopping point okay well i'm glad that we had the chance to have you as our guest and maybe you know we'll be able to have you as a guest again in the future maybe yeah. Oh, okay. Of our studio, but it was a pleasure speaking with you guys, and you you are very positive, and you're sending a very positive message to people, which is the whole point of this podcast is to be positive, so that people aren't afraid and to break the the shatter the stereotypes and the myths about autism, you know, the negative ones, because that's all we really care about in the news, and, and you know, so it's been a pleasure speaking with you guys and hope to speak to you guys again soon. And I hope you get to have some more travel time in after COVID and, you know, get some more nice postcards. That would be good. I hope so too, actually. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. All right. You guys have a great Halloween. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. Yeah. All right. Thank you.